Let's not forget that our panel is actually about crypto investing and uh, great presentations from all of you, but I think now let's get into the meat of it. I want to start off by asking you all to just tell us when you bought your first Bitcoin and what the price was. Just very quickly going down here. Oh, God. Uh, interrogation. Um, maybe 2013. And I don't know. It was around 200, 250 at that time. Jeremy? I came in late. Same. Same. Yeah, I, I, I had the opportunity to buy it in 2011, but I, t I told my buddy, uh, this is the dumbest idea I've ever heard. So I bought it in 2013, 217, I think. Summer of 2013 in a classroom for $300. Yeah. My first investment was actually Ethereum in February of 2017. So we have one honest guy, and then we have a whole lot of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So gentlemen, I think we're all crypto investors and um, we've been through quite an interesting ride where we had this influx of stupid money coming into the market towards the end of last year. And that stupid money got flushed out of the system uh, in December, January and February. And I think now what we're waiting for is we're waiting for more money to come into the market to boost the market. What do you think is going to bring in more money into the market? What are the catalysts that we need to create to bring more money into the market? Uh, 100 million people, it's lending and borrowing. I mean, if you think about the financial system out there, the really the only two products that drive the entire economy are the ability to borrow and us stupid enough to give the banks some money and have them pay us only 1%. So that is trillions of dollars that go through the system every minute, right? And the banks are allowed to issue basically 10 to 1. They keep only, every dollar they keep, they're allowed to, ten, borrow, uh, to lend $10 out. So. Uh, you want the next wave of adoption, you've got to give them something more than just speculating with coins. It's a product they can use every day, and we think that to invite them over to cross that barrier of downloading the wallet and buying something and trusting somebody else with your money who's not a bank, you've got to give them something they can use every day. Um, well, that's wonderful self-promotion, but I think it's pretty far off the target. I don't think this technology is anywhere near consumers being ready to use it. I think the user experience for every single crypto asset is light years away from it being something that's mass adopted. A hundred million people using crypto in the next three years seems just farcical to me. Much more likely to be the catalyst for a major price rally would be real institutional money coming in. Someone like the Yale University Endowment, which I know is eyeing this very closely, major banks are putting together crypto funds real hedge funds that actually have things to hedge with, as opposed to these crypto hedge funds that aren't really hedge funds because they have nothing to hedge with. But these multi-billion dollar funds, those are the guys that are going to catalyze the next rally. I agree in the long run that lending and consumer tools and consumer adoption of crypto assets that they can actually use will be good eventually, uh, a good catalyst for further growth. But in the short term, it's going to be big money that moves the price. Yeah, so, yeah. Jeremy, I want to stay with you before, before we carry on. Yeah. Why, what is going to be the catalyst for these institutions or foundations or endowments to actually start putting money into crypto? The reason why I ask this is because we've been talking about this for the last three years that the institutional money is going to come in. And to date, we haven't seen the institutional money into crypto. What's the barrier? So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of securities concerns with all these ICO tokens. There's a lot of regulatory concerns even with uh, Bitcoin. I mean, the, the concept of a cryptocurrency or crypto asset is when kind of reduced, can, can be seen as a money laundering wet dream. And, 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 and that really, I think, is disconcerting to large financial institutions. However, one thing that I know that a lot of banks are looking at now is they understand this concept of virgin coins, a uh, 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 freshly minted Bitcoin, and knowing the source, uh, the, the miners, and buying directly from them. That way, there's no, um, there's no lack of fungibility that will lead to the coins that they own being traced back to a crime in the past, and then them pot potentially getting in trouble with regulators. And that really concerns them. I think we're actually missing, sorry, a big one, which is efficiency and scalability. Um, me personally, I was just in Dubai about two weeks ago, and I had to exchange currency. I literally was in the airport with uh, like one of my other partners, and I said, man, this would be really nice if I could just use Bitcoin to use my Uber because I had to take um, currency out from an exchange, pay a fee that was like 3 to 5%. So if you have something that's like Bitcoin Lightning, and I don't think that the main net has been tested enough and it can work, but 
If you have that efficiency and you can have people in real time use it, that's really what's going to allow the next inflow. If I can actually have a more seamless and easier life by using cryptocurrencies, why would I not invest more in it? Yeah, but okay. you're not going to have one because the problem with crypto today is that it's not a unit of account. There's not a single stable cryptocurrency. When Bitcoin can swing 20 to 60% in a day, who on earth is going to use it in their average life? It, it, that, I think that's something that kind of flew over the heads of the early adopters, including myself initially. But today, you have to be realistic, and no consumer is going to hold a currency that changes in value every single day. It, it, psychologically, we're, we're not evolved enough to be able to do that in our head. The, the, uh, one I'm second, I think Brent's been uh, he's yeah. jumping out of his seat. So. Yeah, no, I, I mean, first of all, every one of them is correct. I mean, we're all right. We're, we're, we all know where it needs to go. Now, the order of which that happens is I would agree with Jeremy that this is the year of regulation. I think we all kind of hear it coming. We've seen it. I'm privy to some conversations that are going on in our headquarters in Switzerland. And, you know, there's banks that are just waiting to pour money in. Yale, you know, all these places are waiting to pour money in. You just saw Goldman buy, you know, they're, who basically owns Circle, buys Polo. Polo might be doing something with the regulations. You know, these are getting regulated. When that happens, all this institutional money comes in, pours in, and that's when efficiency goes up, and then the consumers go up, and retail goes up. So just like any, I mean, history is repeating itself here, right? But like regulation has to happen, it will. And when that happens, and your product will go up because people will need to now pay their taxes. Um, but all of that all stems from regulation, and nothing's going to happen. I mean, the top six banks in the U.S. hold 50% of our GDP, first of all, right? So like, they're not going to buy an unregulated asset. You're not going to sell any pre-sale tokens to any bank. So until that happens, then all this other thing happens. Well, yeah. I, I'm the only old guy old enough here to have seen this movie before. So I, you know, when I, I was lucky enough to come to the United States as an immigrant in 1994. I saw the internet. I was like, this is amazing. You know, and everybody was talking about how it's going to be email and it's going to be BBSs. And the minute we saw the Netscape moment, everybody realized that it's all going to be consumer and it's all going to be retail. And then the institutional money came in. So the same thing is going to happen here. The smart money is not going to come before they see mass adoption because they're going to be, become immediately the dumb money. The, the, the dumbest thing to do is to buy this thing before mass adoption. So you want to see mass adoption, you need a killer app. Just like Netscape was a killer app, the wallet is the killer app No, now. You should know that. You have a wallet, you know, so... <laughs> Yeah. We, uh, we, we arguably haven't seen a uh, truly useful uh, cryptocurrency yet that people are actually engaging with. The 200 million other Americans that aren't in this room don't understand cryptocurrency. They understand money. They understand things that can buy opportunities and experiences. So when you start to see cryptocurrencies reinventing what money could be, then you will see adoption. First, you'll see scalability solutions in the next you know, year and a half. You'll see some really amazing consumer applications uh, that play to this thesis, likely in 2019, 2020. So, gentlemen, should we be celebrating regulation? Should we be, should we be pushing for formal regulation so that finally the industry will be regulated and real money can flow into the industry? Yes and no. Uh, I mean, that, 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 that's a scary question. Uh, on the one hand, we should push for regulation, but the regulation, we should not be pushing for regulation from the CFT, CFTC, the SEC, or the IRS. Those guys can only enforce laws as they exist today, and that is totally useless for what we're building for tomorrow. So if we're going to push for regulation, it has to be from Congress. That's, or from uh, state, uh, state houses. So we, we saw that just happen in Wyoming, where we, you push for legislation that actually is adapted to the technology that we're building, not trying to retrofit laws to this new paradigm that exists today. Yeah. It's really, I, mean, it's a, I mean, it's a hard thing to regulate when you've got, you know, we're in 170 countries, right? So I try to get a trademark in 170 countries at one time. It's really hard to do. How do you regulate something like this? It's, it's I mean... It's hard, right? And there, these conversations will happen for a long time. The SEC could do whatever they want, but, you know, China doesn't care. They're going to do whatever they want. So the competitiveness, right, if it's, going to, it's going to stunt innovation a little bit. So you have to just be a little light. And I think people in Congress on Wednesday were just talking about you have to be a little light on regulation here because you cannot stop the innovation. Well, we're getting regulation because we didn't self-regulate. So when the regulators are seeing 
uh, shitty ICOs, like one of the slides here was uh, saying, right? They want to protect the consumer, and, and I, don't, I don't blame them. I don't blame the SEC, I don't blame anyone else. Actually, I think they're doing a great job. I can tell you, if we don't get together, if we don't have enough people uh, supporting crypto, it will get squashed. I was in Korea four weeks ago, and the Minister of Finance came out and said, oh, we're going to shut down this whole thing. You know who he, he was representing, right? The banks pay his, his paycheck. And, you know, 250,000 people, Koreans, went to the street in front of parliament and demonstrated. The next day, the government came out and said, no, 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 we're going to review it. This morning, they came out and said, no regulation, okay? So, so this is what you want to happen. But in Korea, 12% of the population holds crypto. Do you know what percentage is in the United States? It's a fraction. It's in, it's, it, it's, it's in 1,000 of 1% 1 of the population. So, so it's, it, unless we all get together and each one of us in the room brings 10 people into crypto every day, we're not going to get there because we're going to get squashed before we have a chance to even show the world what this is all about. I think, I think, I think that you have to, uh, sorry. You, you probably need a lot more education. Um, uh, you, you need more people participating, um, playing with it, um, experiencing what it is to send money across the world for very little fees and experience what it is to have you know, your, your own bank, uh, if you will. Um, I think part of what is scary about getting regulation today is that you have different regulatory agencies that all see this as a cookie jar and they all want to get their hands on the cookie jar. And because of that, you will see very self-serving narratives. Uh, now, crypto is interesting because everybody is perfectly rational in a very self-serving way. Um, from everybody, everybody who is you know, pitching an ICO or coming up with their own uh, crypto hedge fund and so on and so forth. So I think we're, we're past, and in, in the amounts of money that are available now, or at, at least nominally in the system, make it uh, past a, a solution that everybody likes or everybody agrees, right? Because we all think that we're the good guy. Um, we're we're not, never the scammer, we're never the self-interested self -interested person or self-interested um, entity. So I, I think it's just more about keeping, keeping a dialogue, keeping more uh, of a conversation uh, going because the potential is still unknown. It's completely misunderstood. Like we're all imagining what can be, uh, you know, the future if this technology keeps uh, booming and, and we just need to keep that dialogue uh, going on uh, because yeah, the, the frameworks of the past might not be uh, valid, but you still cannot um, avoid the notion of for every other industry or for any other innovation, the way that regulators work is that they apply whatever the existing framework and they adjust it to whatever new situation. So, Nathan? Yeah, I think you just need to ask yourself if you want regulation to come in, what do you want to come out of it? So, um, you know, a little bit of my background, I was going to do M&A and international tax code. So I got to be able to talk to, you know, some people that do international tax for Deloitte and EY. And I'll speak with people that are in Canada that have completely different rules than the United States. So I think that what we really want and what everybody really wants is a level playing field and a chance at fairness. But similar to what you said, how can you have fairness against an international cryptocurrency that has, you know, a foothold in 170 countries? So I really think that if there needs to be uh, an effort that can come by all regulatory agencies, I don't know how that's going to come out particularly, but to have one solution that says, hey, this is how regulation is going to be. Because if there's innovation that has to literally move outside of the United States to get out of the SEC's jurisdiction, is that really allowing growth to happen in the first place? Look, I, I, think, hate, to be, um, I, I hate to be in the, in, the, in, the, in the seats of the regulators. On the one hand, they've got to make sure that the industry thrives in their country, but on the other hand, they've got to make sure that investors are protected. So they are, yeah. they are juggling two balls at the same time. Yeah. yeah, I think a lot of what we're seeing is uh, people essentially saying, hey, I'm going to build a really great golf course. It's going to have 18 holes. It's going to be beautiful. Do you want to buy a golf membership? And, you know, they get a bunch of money in, in memberships, but effectively don't build this golf course at all. It, it shouldn't be easy to do that. 
uh, in this space. So I think what you're going to see is um, you're going to see a lot of overregulation in the beginning. That, that's typically been uh, how regulation has worked in the past. You're going to see more self-regulation sort of fight back, and we'll find an equilibrium probably in the next two years. Can I make a point? I mean, when the internet was three years old, Netscape had 100 million downloads. Bitcoin is almost 10 years old, and it has less than 30 million uh, users, okay? Just to put things in perspective. So we're sitting here and celebrating. The, the internet has six, close to 6 billion users, okay? We should have no problem with mass adoption. Yet we're sitting here and, and saying, oh, it's not going to happen when it's going to happen, when it's going to come. So we have to simplify the product. The product has to be so simple and so easy to use and I'm talking about tax, and I'm talking about the user interface, and I'm talking about everything else, we have to eliminate all that issue with addresses and sending it to the wrong place. Alexander, I don't want to spend too much time on adoption. I want to keep the discussion around real crypto Without investing. It, all these coins are worthless. I can tell you that much. Okay, so that's actually my, my next question. We've got a couple of, uh, of minutes left. You mentioned the word shitcoins. We've all heard the term shitcoins. But there are good coins that we should be investing in here. So specifically for those of you who run funds, and Jeremy, I know you run a fund, and I think one or two of you around here run funds and advisory services. Talk to us about your investment thesis. And stay away from the generic stuff. Yes, we know you've got to look at the team. And give, uh, us the, give us the meat and potatoes. All right. So you have to think, if we went back to the, the, the matrix I had before, what you want to think about is the different assets that exist within this crypto asset class. So the, the real tokens that you have to think about are protocol tokens, which are the tokens that are given uh, out as a reward mechanism for validating transactions in the net network, whether it's Bitcoin, Ethereum, NEO, whatever. Then what you have is uh, utility tokens uh, or application tokens, whatever you want to call them. I created the first with Augur, and I thought it was this really niche sort of token that wouldn't really take off. And of course, in hindsight, I, I feel horrible because I opened Pandora's box to these horrible, pretty much effectively securities offerings where entrepreneurs realized they could raise undiluted capital for their company if they just said they were creating a token that enabled people to use their application. Uh, so that's 98% of utility tokens. And then lastly, something that we actually created at Blockchain Capital, my last fund, is the security token, which is a token that re represents a security uh, in the real world, or something that is scarce in the real world, that is then tokenized and put on the blockchain. These are the main three cri crypto assets, and I think moving forward, we're going to see a real departure from utility tokens, because most of these effectively are securities anyhow, and moving them towards security tokens. And then the main crypto asset classes you'll see are really the security tokens, protocol tokens, and a handful of utility tokens that actually have utility and often will stem from security tokens in the future. So am I right in saying that your current investment thesis is to avoid utility tokens? 99% of them. I mean, there, there are some that are fabulous, but there's I, less than a half, I'd say there are less than five ERC-20 tokens that I like. Talk to me about the fabulous ones. Well, there's augers, uh, and that's total bias and self-promotion, but it, it is a true utility token. The application does not work if you do not have a token. That augers token is wrapped, and it creates decentralized consensus on the application. That is a really powerful use case, and anybody that's thinking about creating a utility token should look at augers model to see how it is this necessary component of the architecture, which otherwise would cause the application to sacrifice decentralization. Uh, another one is Funfair, which enables the opening up of state channels, or ZeroX, which allows for a decentralized exchange protocol. But you really, there needs to be necessary utility, or the token needs to make the experience at least 10x better. But anyone that's creating a token just as a means to raise capital and figuring out kind of the utility later, bad news bears. Gentlemen, anyone else run a fund or have an investment thesis? Yeah, so... Alex, you don't run a fund. I, I actually have 200 investments, if you look at my website, including over 30 in crypto. So saying that I'm not an investor, I, I bet you I, I put more money to work than everybody else on the panel here. Just look it up. <laughs> I mean, okay, so, let, let's, give, let's give Bradley anyway, a go, because I, go I, I think... You go. No, you, you can go first. If you need to. Uh, look, uh, if anyone tells you they know what's going to win and what's not going to win, I, I just sit here and laugh at that, okay? In 2004, when everybody was saying that the worst idea in the world is social media, you know, the people that put money into Facebook made the best investment in history. 
So no one knows shit about this, okay? I mean, anyone who sits here and tells you that they know what the future looks like. Mm -hmm. I've been doing VC work for 30 years, over 200 investments. You know, ask Tim Draper, who was here on the panel before that, if he really knows. He doesn't. It's a spray and pray practice. You put as much money to work as you can, and you hope that the two or three winners are going to pay for all your losers. All these guys that pretend to be geniuses, have them explain to you all the bad investments that they've made. Okay? <laughs> so the point is, no one here knows what the future looks like. You want to know what it is? You find the people who are passionate about something and they're doing it for the right reason. Anyone who's doing it just to make money, and I agree with some people who said that here, I agree with everything you're saying, just find the people who are actually trying to solve a real problem and trying to take this, take this uh, community to the next level. Because without that, nothing will happen. Nothing. Okay, if the internet had 50 million users, we wouldn't be sitting here. So Alex is saying spray so, and pray. Bradley, you've been uh, no, but, to say something. You've got one minute so, left. So uh, if, I can, if I can go for a second, yeah. part of my, sorry, it's just my, my slides got like all uh, push over, right? Um, it, it is all about the team. That's the thing. That's the, that's the only thing that, that matters ultimately. Because right now it's kind of hard to say, right? Most of the tokens that have raised money have, are, are not even live, right? So there's trading on the basis of who knows what. But yeah, you, you honestly don't know, and you're still subject to the power love returns. Would you describe? Well, Y Combinator did a survey of thousands of VC investments, and they thought, they, they thought it would be the team. It wasn't the team. They thought it was marketing geniuses. No, it wasn't. It was all about timing. And you can look it up. McKinsey did a, 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 a they audited it. They didn't believe it. They said, no way. McKinsey did the same thing. It came out. Oh, timing. Timing is the most important element. And because it's timing, no one knows what the right timing is for anything. So look it up. Okay, you have all two, Google, two in, look it up. Two investments in XRP and Ether would outperform any spray and pray approach. Full stop. The point is, who is the XRP now? Who, who, what, name a name now that is going to outperform everybody else. Not Looking back in the mirror, everybody can do that. The point is, name right now, who's going to outperform all the other coins? Okay, gentlemen, gentlemen, we're running out of time, but uh, Bradley, we, we've, got, we've got to get, let you say what you were going to say before. <laughs> no, 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 let me push back. No, no, it's, it's Bradley, stand up. Okay, do um, you want me to stand there? Yeah, please, because otherwise the guys aren't going to let you talk. <laughs> okay, all right. So, close so, it out, Bradley. All right, so, I'm, all right, I'll just step up. So, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave everyone with, like, one sentence here. So, think about this whole space as, like, the map and the territory, right? Think of the territory as, like, the history of money, right? From gold to, you know, paper money to fiat money, it shall be. And all of a sudden, you have this new, you know, digital territory with Bitcoin. And all of a sudden, people are creating these digital maps, right? And all of a sudden, it's very lucrative to be a cartographer and say, hey, you know, this is how I see the territory through this map, right? And if you want to see the territory through my map, just come over here and buy map token, right? So we're seeing a lot of map tokens, but I'm just going to leave you with one sentence, basically. The map is not the territory, right? So when you're thinking about the space, think of people that are going into uncharted territory and sort of trying to construct and build and create new forms of, of money, which is sort of how we're thinking about the space. But OK, leave it there. Gentlemen, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.